Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Rikindi. Uh, before I begin, I just wanted to apologize in advance to my regular listeners. I'm not in a uh, my proper recording studio at the moment. I'm just doing some traveling, but I have found a sound booth. Um, so hopefully the sound quality shouldn't be uh, too bad. So today we're do- joined by David Ashi. David is a dog breeder and biohacker from Mississippi, whose goal is to make genetic engineering accessible to everyone. He was recently on the Netflix documentary, Unnatural Selection, which sheds light on his work. So with all of that, David, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. So David, I thought it would just be great to um, start off with telling everyone a little bit about yourself. What got you interested in um, gene editing? Um, so uh, <laughs> I've always kind of been interested in, gen- in, in genetics in sort of general terms, like as a dog breeder, of course, you're interested in genetics. Um, my particular program wasn't just, you know, breed more dogs. So my particular program was to try and recover the mastiff into the dog that it once was, you know, their current form, they're very um, overbred and highly inbred uh, to be, you know, uh, unathletic and, and incapable of doing the job that they were originally bred for. So that required me to do a lot of crossbreeding and stuff like that. So you kind of have to think about genetics more when you're doing stuff like that. Um, And I guess that's part of what really got me started on the idea of like genetics. But as a dog breeder, you never go very far. Like that's not genetic engineering. Um, What really changed things was I was at work one day um, and there wasn't much going on. I was watching a TED talk about... Uh, genetic engineering and it it was talking specifically about de novo synthesis which is where like you can make dna from just base chemicals and you can just take a sequence of dna that you want send it to a company they'll print it out into a string of dna in the sequence that you designed and send it to you in the mail and then you can put that in an organism and so that really changed my perspective on where we were in biology. Like I thought biotech was uh, so far out of reach, so inaccessible that you know, why even try? Um, like if you're not a multi-million dollar corporation, you don't have a chance of learning any of this stuff, but it turns out I was wrong. So it was just a matter of learning what was possible. And that really kind of opened the door for me. Then it was like, if, it, if, it, if it's possible, then this is what dogs need. Mm. And so talk us through a little bit about how CRISPR actually works. Um, so CRISPR is so CRISPR is one of a suite of tools, right? So think of CRISPR like like a screwdriver, you know? So like there's times you use CRISPR, there's times not to use CRISPR. Um, CRISPR, I think, gets a little too much hype, even though it's really great. There's more to where things are in genetic engineering than CRISPR. But in a nutshell, Cas9... Uh, is a part of the bacterial immune system, right? These CAS proteins, and this is one of them. But basically what it does is it's a protein that kind of acts like scissors. It'll cut DNA. Um, The nice thing about being able to cut DNA uh, is this particular one is programmable. Um, Bacteria use it so that they can take little bits of viral DNA uh, from viruses that attack the bacteria, uh, and they can chop up pieces of their genome, and they can use it as sort of a reference library. And they can have Cas9 floating around, waiting to cut any virus DNA they find. And they can chop up DNA. The nice thing is we can hijack that system. So we can pull out the virus DNA, put in some piece of DNA that you want to cut, and then Cas9 will find it and cut it. The nice thing about that is if you can cut precisely, programmably, in an easy way, there are other technologies that are a little older that will also do this. Uh, zinc finger and talon specifically but cas9 is way easier it's it's super super easy because it's just based on homology so you just read the sequence off the dna convert that into rna and you're ready to go um super easy anybody can do it and the nice thing about crispr is say you want to delete a gene well you can just tell crispr to cut that gene and it'll just keep cutting it and the cell will repair it, but it'll keep cutting it over and over again until it changes. And when it changes enough, the uh, the video, sorry, when it changes enough, the the like if you're if you're imagining a, a 
uh, an animation of this, right? So you have the, the sequence of DNA. So you've got all these letters organized. There's an upstream sequence that the guide RNA uses to recognize its target, and then it cuts the DNA there. Well, when it makes repairs, occasionally it's going to make errors. And if it makes an error in such a way that the guide doesn't line up anymore, like if this piece is mutated, then it will stop cutting. So it means that it just sort of tends to move towards, you know, a uh, 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 mutations specifically for knockouts and things like that. Um, the other way to do it is you can give it a template for the repair. Uh, and this is something, an alternate repair pathway. Since, for example, humans uh, were diploids, so we have two sets of our genomes, right? So you have the genes you inherited from your mother and the genes you inherited from your father. And so those two sets of genes, you have two copies of each gene for the most part. And so if you take uh, and damage one in one particular cell, a, a piece of DNA gets damaged. Well, it can use the other one as a template for repair. And so it can actually use like your mother's gene to repair your father's DNA, both in your own same, in that same cell. And so what you can do is you can trick it by taking the regions near it the and copying them basically on a piece of DNA and then putting whatever change you want in the middle. You cut the DNA and then it sees, oh, here's a nice template to repair this. It matches up perfectly. I don't know what's in the middle because that's gone now. And then it uses that to copy. And so as it's making this like repair, it's actually modifying the DNA. So it thinks it's repairing it using a template uh, that would naturally be there, but it's repairing it using a template that you designed. Mm -hmm. So the design that you made ends up in the cell. And that's really the powerful part about CRISPR is the tools and techniques are really simple. The, uh, it's pretty reliable and it's really, um, it's really straightforward. Like the, the, the learning curve is super low. Like it doesn't take anything to really learn uh, how to do that. Yeah. That's CRISPR. Yeah. So I was also just curious because like cancer, right? Um, a cancer cell is different from the rest of every other cell. And usually it would self-destruct if it develops differently. Do you think that that would potentially, like so if you edit genes wrong or, or you try edit gene, do you think one of the side effects could potentially be developing cancer or any sort of terminal? Totally. So anytime you alter DNA, Cancer is, is always a risk, right? But that also includes every time you alter DNA uh, by getting sunshine, right? So that's why like you have a minimum, um, like a maximum amount of sunshine you're supposed to get in your lifetime before you're probably gonna get skin cancer, right? Uh, or any kind of radiation. Um, so does oxygen, right? So oxygen, sunshine, all these things cause DNA damage and DNA damage gets repaired. And if there's a dramatic piece of damage that usually results in the cell doing what you're talking about, apoptosis, you know, destroying itself. The, and that's really what a sunburn is, right? So you get DNA damage from the sun and then your cells recognizing that they're incapable of repairing this much damage, destroy themselves uh, in an effort to save you from the possibility of cancer. Um, so as long as those systems are working correctly, uh, Cancer is a low risk. The problem is with most cancers, say you keep accumulating DNA damage, one of the things that could get damaged is this anti-cancer system, right? There's a lot of pieces to it. So if it gets damaged in a really critical way, like P53 is a gene that if it gets damaged, then cells don't really know how to stop and they don't really know how to, to do apoptosis anymore. You don't get programmed cell death. So, if then sometime later that cell or some cell descended from it gets DNA damage, it won't do apoptosis anymore. And if it continues to happen enough, there's, and you eventually end up mutating some gene involved in growth or, or the regulation of growth, then you end up with a cell that just wants to keep growing and replicating. The problem with cancer is it's, it's sort of evolutionarily favored from the cell's perspective, right? So like if a cell becomes cancerous, 
uh, and it reproduces a lot and avoids all the problems that want to kill it, it's it's sort of a survival of the fittest situation. So more and more, uh, like the adaptations that will likely serve its lineage are the same ones that destroy us in the end. So anytime you damage DNA, you run the risk that you're damaging some critical anti-cancer gene. The problem, the, the thing to be, bear in mind though, every time you've ever had like a DNA virus, uh, like uh, every time you've, um, you know, uh, been out in the sunshine and just every day constantly as your cells replenish themselves these errors accumulate that's why sort of eventually if you live long enough you wind up with cancer so editing dna uh does run those risks right so if you have some uh like not nearly as bad as like mutagenesis so that's just random dna mutation like when you walk outside uh and random dna mutation we're not, we don't go around particularly afraid of, right? So like, we don't go into the sun and go, well, I'm definitely gonna get cancer today, I was in the sun. So you have to be overexposed to sun many, many times before you consider it a significant risk of getting skin cancer. And so that's the same kind of thing. Gene editing yourself or being gene edited like one time or something like that probably has a slight, it's going to be a, a larger than zero chance, but it's still like zero point blah, blah, blah chance of causing cancer, right? So it's kind of like going out in the sun once and getting sunburned. Mm. But if you do it a lot, like say you just were gene editing yourself every day, that's kind of like going to the tanning bed every day. You know, you're eventually going to roll the dice in a bad way. Mm. So like if, um, let's say for instance, I was um, pregnant and I was wanting to edit my, I mean, I'm not, I'm just as a hypothetical, um, would, what are the risks though associated with that be, so you could have a, a child that is extra strong or has beautiful long hair or um, blue eyes, whatever it is, but would the risk of editing the embryo then have a huge side effect? So what you, what you would want to do in that kind of scenario is you'd want to confirm things, right? So let's say embryo editing. What you would really want to do, if you're trying to fix a genetic disease, for example, um, you weigh the risk against the risk of the disease. So if you have a debilitating genetic disease, the zero point whatever percent chance of some other problem becomes pretty negligible, right? So that's an easy one. If you're to, but you're talking about uh, genetic editing for like non-disease purposes, like enhancement or something, then it's ethically a lot trickier. But say you want to create a situation where uh, you want to minimize those risks, because you could obviously just inject an embryo with a adeno-associated virus loaded with your package, right? And then that would deliver the DNA. Um, that's been done in all kinds of species many, many times, right? So what you would want to do uh, is you would want to extract the embryo. So you have the embryo you know, in the lab. Um, and at a very, very, you know, young age, we're talking like a fistful of cells, you do your gene editing. Um, then you can take that, take a small number of cells, like even a cell or two, sequence that out and see what happened. You know, make sure that no damage was done. And then you can proceed with that embryo being implanted and so on. Or you can take cells, uh, just like skin cells or embryonic cells even, grow them in a Petri dish and take them, edit them, and you can do all the laboratory tests you could ever want to do, right? So you could, you could uh, uh, edit the cells, make sure that all your edits are perfect and no other part of the genome is modified in any way. And then you could take that cell, it's like nucleus, and use it in something like somatic cell nuclear transfer. And this is used a lot in animals. This is how it's typically done in animals. It's never been done in humans though. Um, and then use that to start a clone, basically, and then clone from your edited uh, uh, cells, and you'll get what you put into it. So what you'll end up with is the, even though there are risks associated with the editing, you can screen against them before you actually, like, give birth to somebody yeah. Yeah, so that I you don't end up with somebody who's hurt. And so if there's, like, a bad cell, you just toss that cell and take the next cell over. Yeah, I had a... Um look at one of the doctors i think it was like um hong kong or taiwan i, I don't want to say something where it's where it's legal to do cloning and uh he um clones uh dogs all the time for 
uh, pet owners who yeah. have absolutely loved their dog. And it's interesting because he even said, you know, even though you're cloning this dog, uh, their behavior is so different and their personality is different because right. that isn't necessarily coded by your genes. That's more your experiences and how you are modified. Um, totally. Mm. Totally. Yeah. I and mean, that's the thing is like a clone's never going to be you, you know, <laughs> it's, um, but uh, if you like fertilize an egg, and let it become like four or five cells and then culture those cells into a bunch of cells and then edit them and put them back then you know, it's sort of still the first instance. But if you're looking at um, like a dog, for example, if you've got a dog that you just love their personality and all of that stuff, um, cloning them won't necessarily like bring them back. Uh, you'll get all the dog's genetic potential, which can be important, right? Um, like say you have a dog who's just particularly extraordinary at some task. It may be that he had an exceptionally high genetic potential and that his training and his experiences helped him to reach it. Um, and so cloning that dog may be better than some other, like if you had a you know, world-class greyhound or something who's just like the fastest dog there's ever been, some of that's definitely genetic. Um, but also training and environment are a huge part of that. Um, you does, know, that's why identical twins aren't totally identical. Does junk DNA have anything to do with that? Is that the... So junk DNA is sort of a catch-all term. So originally it was used to refer to things like introns and stuff, which we've kind of learned is not really junk. Um, introns are uh, used a lot in the regulatory process, and they're also used in making sort of alternate versions of proteins by sort of swapping out pieces. Um, but there are other parts of our genome that are like viral integrations from forever from like our like primitive mammal ancestors there's uh something there's something called the mariner sequence uh which is in everything descended from fish which is just this sort of jumping gene that just duplicated itself like a ridiculous number of times and there's a bunch of things like that that are just everywhere and evolution has a tendency to co-op those things to turn them into useful things since they're there uh, so some of them have kind of come into use, um, just being exploited. But uh, most of it is just stuff. It's just the gaps between your genes. Um, but in terms of how that affects gene expression, uh, it's more like, it's complicated. <laughs> All this stuff's complicated. It's more like uh, epigenetics, right? So there are markers that turn genes on and off. And within some of the parts that are like non-coding regions uh, and even stuff that isn't like particularly regulatory but aren't specifically coding regions either. Um, there are areas where your DNA can change and it doesn't really make much difference, but depending on epigenetic markers, it can change like how your genome is sort of wrapped up and, and stretched out so that different genes get expressed at different levels. Um, but that's like, it's got more to do with like your skin cells and your brain cells have the same genome, same genes, but they're not the same. They act differently because different genes are on, different genes are off. So all your skin cell specific genes are off in your brain and all your brain cell specific genes are off in your skin. That way skin cells only make skin genes and brain cells only make brain genes. So um, if you're trying to if you're looking at the difference between people who are like identical twins or clones or something like that, uh, epigenetics is a big thing, but it's less about like uh, non-coding regions like junk DNA stuff uh, and more about the sort of additional markers that are added to the genome to switch genes on and off. Yeah, okay. No, that, 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 that makes sense. Um, and so talk us through then um, what, what has been your experience with um, your dog breeding? Um, what have been some of the challenges you've uh, faced? What has been some of the um, uh, leaps and bounds that you've overcome? So biggest challenge uh, is chemistry for me. But so the particular technique that I'm focusing on uh, is something called sperm mediated gene transfer. Um, usually when you're trying to edit the genome of a whole animal, you'll edit either an embryo or an egg. Um, the upside of that is, you know, eggs are huge cells. So they're really easy to like see and work with and they're the genesis point. So if you edit the egg successfully, all of the cells descended from that will carry your 
edits. So it's a really great way to do that. Uh, editing an embryo is a little bit easier um, because eggs don't like to stay eggs for very long once they're fertilized. Um, but editing an embryo uh, can, can result in mosaic expression where, uh, you know, even if it's only got, you know, eight cells or something when you do the edit, maybe only seven of them get edited and you've got one seventh of your creature at the end is, is normal. Um, and that happens a lot, especially in like mouse models. It's generally what you do is you edit an embryo and then that embryo grow, you know, you have a little litter of mice, you pick the ones that have the most of your edits and then breed those in a further generation and select their offspring. So the offspring of the mosaic expression ones will have uh, normal expression. But if you edit the egg, it's super easy. Problem with that is the egg has to be surgically extracted, right? Uh, and I wanted to create a technique that was usable by dog breeders uh, that didn't require, um, you know, special facilities where you have to like, you know, put the dog unconscious, use, you know, tools. And, and generally the way it's done is pretty invasive. And dogs are particularly difficult in this space because in vitro fertilization, um, like artificial insemination, where you just like turkey based or some sperm in there has been around for forever with dogs. Um, but in vitro fertilization, where you actually like extract an egg and some sperm and test to baby them, right? Uh, was never, was not done successfully until 2015 in dogs. It's been done in humans since like the seventies. There are people walking around with test tube babies, right? Mm -hmm. It's a really reliable technique um, in humans and lots of other animals, but didn't work in dogs. For decades and decades, we tried and didn't know why. And finally, it came out, dogs, eggs, and sperm just have some strangeness to them as compared to other mammals. Like dogs are the only mammals whose uh, eggs are uh, ovulated, but are still immature. So they don't mature in the ovaries, they mature in the fallopian tubes. Oh. Um, so trying to time when you extract them is difficult because you can't just be like, well, they're out, so they've got to be good. Um, and then they're really dark. They have a lot of lipids in them, so they're hard to see what state they're in under the microscope. So it's difficult to time everything. And then dog sperm has some weird sensitivities to everything, <laughs> like everything. And so it's really difficult to handle them uh, properly because uh, they just need the special media and stuff like that. But once all of that was figured out, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was possible to do artificial or excuse me, in vitro fertilization with dogs. And, uh, so that is a possibility, right? You do in vitro fertilization or even cloning, like you edit some cells and clone them and send them. So that's, those are all possibilities now that weren't, didn't even exist when I started my project, right? So the project, so the method that I was going for was something called sperm mediated gene transfer, where you edit the sperm and then send the sperm in. So it's like modified... Uh, artificial insemination. So if you can imagine collecting sperm, you know, like add your DNA and sort of the magic sauce that makes it happen and then turkey baste it and then you have modified puppies. Like that's the, that's the ideal. And it does work in some species. Like it's been done in pretty diverse species. It's been done in chickens, various fish, uh, even some mollusks and um, uh, pigs and things like that. So the, the main research has been on pigs because obviously it's a lot less invasive and a lot more available. And since artificial insemination is something that dog breeders do regularly, it's, uh, it's within the skill set of what dog breeders can and regularly do. So uh, having access to a technique that is just a modification of that means any dog breeder could do it. And the real problem is there are hundreds of genetic diseases afflicting dogs, like more than any other animal species. And for context, uh, wolves have about seven genetic diseases and dogs have over 700. And so that's us. We did that. Um, the current practices to try and uh, get rid of those problems is mostly about testing and breeding out. And that's going to take hundreds of years to succeed without just destroying their genetic diversity. Uh, and that's a big part of the problem in the first place is their lack of genetic diversity. Um, and in some breeds, there's not enough genetic diversity even in existence within the context of that breed to, to breed it out. So 
Dalmatians are the example I always go to. Um, they have a disease called uh, hyperuricemia. Um, and unfortunately, they all have it. The whole breed is affected. So how do you breed it out? Uh, and there was a geneticist in the 70s, 80s, somewhere in there, who started a backbreeding program. So he bred pointers into the Dalmatians. And then the Dalmatians, and then bred those offspring, tested the ones that had it and the ones that didn't, which, of course, they all carried for it. But bred those back to Dalmatians, back to Dalmatians. And through a 30-year breeding program, they were able to create dogs that are mostly Dalmatian, a little bit of pointer, just where they need it to be. Right. So just those like healthy genes that, that allow them to process uric acid. The trouble is uh, it took 30 years for the AKC to recognize them as being Dalmatians. And of course, you can't just stop breeding all the other Dalmatians or all the Dalmatians will be descended from this one small project. So their genetic diversity will tank. So it's a solution that will take 200 years to work. Um, and the problem, but what would be nice is if you could get a vial of DNA that had CRISPR loaded up with all the repair mechanisms built into it. So it's kind of like molecular surgery. You add that to the sperm, it modifies the sperm or the sperm carry it to the egg and it modifies the fertilized egg. Um, and then you test your puppies and some of your puppies are healthy, even if it's like one in a litter. If you could give that to a thousand breeders, you could have a thousand unrelated dogs who are healthy. And that genetic disease could be eliminated in what? two, five years instead of 200. Wow. And so that technique is what I've been trying to transition from, from pigs to dogs. And that's like my big project, but it's, it's hard because <laughs> like I said, dogs, sperm and eggs are strange. So everything has to be developed basically from scratch. The pig methods don't work. So I'm having to modify everything. And there's a lot of chemistry that goes into it, try and make, all of this work. Uh, and the biggest problem is like the frequency of trials. So uh, like dogs go and eat every six months. So I can only really try every six months. <laughs> and the, my biggest issue right now is that those modifications, like I can modify dog sperm uh, and I've got, uh, cause you can label DNA like with fluorescent compounds. And then you can see when the DNA actually binds to the sperm. So I can make dog, Dog sperm is happy to pick up DNA that you get it. The trouble is, uh, with the techniques that I'm using, with the protocol that I'm using, it doesn't yield puppies. And it's not that it doesn't yield modified puppies. It doesn't yield any puppies at all. So that tells me the issue has something to do with the protocol itself is damaging all the sperm, uh, which from the fluorescent labeling, I can tell that it's not modifying all the sperm. So it's not the modification that's damaging the sperm. Uh, and I've changed the way I'm modifying them enough to know that. But it's something that's damaging all the sperm. And I think it has to, I think it has to do with the amount of, like the pH, the calcium, and the magnesium. I don't have to go into the chemistry. But basically, uh, I've got to get the chemistry right. And the problem is, when you've got enough ingredients, there's a lot of sliders to move around. And it just sort of becomes like the number of possible recipes you know, skews into the tens of thousands. And so you have to, you have to make your best guess and try six months later, make your best guess and try again. So it's one of those things that if I had a thousand dogs, I could do quickly if I was a big company, but being one guy, it's just going to be one of these things that you just slowly get there. Uh, what, are so some of the, what are some of the milestones that you've actually overcome? What are... So, um, the biggest thing for me was uh, was actually confirming that the uh, that the sperm was uh, successfully modified, um, and that took some special equipment and and a good bit of work. But um, I feel like with that particular project, you know, because there's big gaps in between, I've had to take on I've taken on many other projects, too many, honestly, um, uh, and so. Uh, like another thing I was looking into was uh, gene therapy because once you, even if you can modify the, the dogs who are uh, yet to be born and cure them before they're born, the issue becomes how do you 
um, uh, what do you do with the dogs who are already here? You know, they're still suffering also. So the other part of my project is working on gene therapies and trying to make them as cheap and accessible as possible. The problem with those uh, is most gene therapies available on the market right now cost about a million dollars. The last one that just got on the market, just got approved, was $3 million a dose, which is insane. Nobody, you can't even afford that for yourself, much less for your dog. So it, it, with those kind of prices, they're basically saying dogs will never benefit from gene therapy uh, because the price of gene therapy isn't going down. People are like, well, okay, it's a million dollars, but it'll get cheaper over time. Unfortunately, it's been going the other way. Uh, it's been going like most healthcare costs in the U.S. It's just been getting higher and higher. Um, so it went from three million to uh, just over, or one million to just over two. The latest one is is three million. I think the cheapest one available is eight hundred thousand dollars an eye. <laughs> so you can pick just one eye if you only want to have vision on one side. Gotcha. But um, it's absurd. It's absurd. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. But there are other methods that are used in animals pretty frequently in the lab to make uh, genetically modified animals and do genetic research um, that aren't as expensive as those. And a lot of that has to do with the regulatory process and a lot of things like this. But um, if you were going to try and make the most accessible gene therapy that would affect something the size of like a mastiff, right? Uh, you're not going to use a denoassociated virus because it's... Um, it's really expensive to make. So there's non-viral methods, uh, which currently I don't think any gene therapy uses non-viral methods. I guess the closest would be like uh, uh, the COVID vaccines that use temporary expression with, with RNA uh, or some of them like the one in India, you actually use this DNA uh, and it expressed um, also temporarily, but you know, uh, so those, it's kind of the same technology, just scale it up much, much bigger. Uh, and instead of expressing something like just a random viral protein that'll flag your immune system, say you expressed Cas9 and a guide and a template, so now you can start doing massive gene editing, um, or you can just do what they typically do, which is gene replacement. So you have a broken gene, you just load that gene up, give it to the animal, and then that animal has that gene. The problem is, uh, the efficiency is low. So you have to either work with huge doses or find ways to up, upgrade the efficiency. And with that project, uh, I was actually able to, um, with some mice, uh, extend their lives. Uh, about, it was like 14%, which was equivalent to what, what the papers had uh, using sort of a modified circular loop of DNA. Uh, but that took two years uh, to test, you know, because like, I, I, those mice, those mice were born here and I cared for them their whole lives. And, uh, the, 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 uh, the ones that were modified lived the longest and were the healthiest. And, you know, that sort of test just takes time. And that's sort of the, the main hurdle with regard to like biohacking in the genetic space is it, it takes patience. You know, it's not something that you're going to just finish in six months. So there's a lot of little mind milestones along the way. Like when I first wanted to learn how to do this, I sort of built a syllabus for myself, right? I printed off a calendar and I was like, okay, this is the time I want to do the genetic modification. So these are the skills I'm going to need to know how to do before then. So I just worked backwards in the calendar. It's like, by this date, I need to know how to do this and so on. So it's like, you start out with the simplest stuff, grow bacteria then genetically modify the bacteria, then pull DNA out of the bacteria. And then you can use bacteria to make your DNA that you're going to use with the other cells. And, you know, modify other cells, prove to yourself that you did, grow cells in culture, um, genetically modify uh, uh, animal cells, culture animal cells, the, the, all these little milestones along the way. Um, and, you know, there's a the kind of, work doesn't usually end up like there's big moments where things happen and it feels amazing <laughs> and then there's a whole lot of little moments where you just push that boulder a little further up the hill and it's it's a lot of those so it takes patience and it takes a lot of um 
uh, and takes a lot of stick to itiveness, and that that I think is probably the hardest part. Um, but as far as milestones, you know, I think the first time I genetically modified anything was amazing. First time I designed my own DNA and put it in something and it worked was amazing. Um, the first time I could see for sure that I had successfully modified uh, dog sperm was amazing. Uh, the first time I modified human cells, uh, the first time I, uh, uh, like when I did the math to show that the um, modification was successful on the mice. Um, and, you know, just a bunch of little stuff like that. Just just incremental steps walking yeah. towards it. Yeah. So um, I can see the advantage of um, having this technology would help um, uh, diversify or decentralize the medical system where you're saying it, it's very expensive, particularly for dog breeders, um, to try and, and alter their, their dogs. Um, and only large corporations would be willing to pay for the million, which is only increasing. And for people who have genetic um, disabilities or issues, what would you say um, would potentially be some of the ethical concerns that a lot of people are quite skeptical of? Um, yeah. Um, so the ethics is always the tricky part um, because it's, in my mind, most people get it backwards. Um, most people, I think, when they think about editing genes, uh, their initial sort of perspective is, that's scary, maybe we shouldn't do that. And if we should, it should only be the most controlled, the most centralized and the most, um, uh, you know, regulated organizations that are doing it. The trouble is, in any field of science or technology, uh, if you, if it's a kind of thing that represents power, right? Like the power to change things in the world. If that power is isolated to a small number of people uh, or a small number of corporations, then you have to ask yourself, are the, are the goals of those corporations and people aligned with everybody else? <laughs> and so generally the goals of these corporations is to make as much money as possible. And that's not necessarily the goal that we really want out of genetic engineering, right? Is to make a few corporations as much money as possible. What we really want out of it is that it can cure a bunch of people with genetic diseases like me. I have a genetic disease, I was born with it. Um, and so are my brother and sister. And, you know, it was one of the reasons I decided not to have kids. Um, you know, luckily uh, I was sort of happily surprised with a kid one day, but, um, it, uh, it happens that way sometimes. And, and both my kids are healthy and it's, it's, it's worked out for the best. And, you know, all my nieces and nephews are healthy also, but it, it might not have been that way. And I get contacted by thousands of people who aren't so lucky. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a pretty deep kind of desperation you have to feel before you, you know, send an email to a dog breeder to ask if they can help your kid, you know, who's got a genetic problem. And it's because a lot of these people have, have tried. I mean, it's not like they don't go to the doctor first. They go to the doctor, the doctor tells them they can't do anything. They beat their head up against the system for long enough that finally they get desperate and start talking to people like me. And I'm not the person, you know, um, I, can't, I can't cure your child. And unfortunately uh, the system lets these people fall through the cracks and when you have a system that has such big gaps in it obviously there's there's an there's a, a, a an unmet need right and i think that's primarily because the people with the tools to fix these problems don't necessarily have the incentives to fix them um and that's a big problem because if you're trying to cure a disease that only affects three people sometimes with these genetic diseases it can be one person you can be a, a single patient with a genetic disease and the technology exists to cure you but the regulatory environment and the business case don't exist to make a gene therapy for one person um, but it should like we have the technology to cure a sick person we should use it and for me oh sorry go ahead 
No, I was just saying, so um, why do you think then that these um that there are such staunch ethical concerns with only a select few doing this within a controlled lab? What do you think the repercussions may be that everybody is so paranoid that um, something could go wrong? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing is people are afraid that an independent will misuse the technology, right? Um, that and like somebody that? like me would what? make it coronavirus or something, you know, make some sort of a plague. The trouble with that idea though, um, is, you know, if you're looking for somebody who's likely to make like a weapon of mass destruction using technology, you should first look at the people who like actively do make weapons of mass destruction, like governments, right? Like if somebody's gonna use it to make a bioweapon, because making a bioweapon is not as easy as it sounds. Like if you were going to try and make a virus that was uh, extra infectious to humans and all these sorts of things, you're going to have to try. Um, and that means you're going to need like human test subjects. And most people don't have human test subjects laying around to do medical experiments on, right? Most people complain when you try to do that. So it's like, if you're talking about an entity that has human test subjects and the will to make weapons that kill millions of people, it's going to be something like a government. So, I mean, I would look at places like, North Korea or somewhere like that, where you have like a, a staunch uh, dictator who's been known to do human uh, uh, human rights violations and things like that. And those kinds of places are the places I would be the most afraid of, of somebody actually like building a lab to create bioweapons to, to do a lot of damage. Um, but in terms of things like uh, individuals, like somebody like me, it's just not possible, not really. Um, it's a lot, and it's because it's a lot easier to fix something than it is to create something new, right? So, like, if it's if it's broken, you know what it's supposed to be. So you just put it back to where it was supposed to be. Like, what is the sequence needed to make a um, a, a dog that's blind see? Well, you just look at all the dogs that aren't blind, and you know what DNA sequence they have there, and you know what this dog has in that spot and so you just make it like the others so the design is pretty simple but trying to make something novel that would avoid all of our uh uh tools and infect humans and all this stuff that's a that's a you know it's it's weapons design it's like really really hard um so that's not the kind of thing i but, th but that's the sort of general fear that people have yeah. um but i i think of it along the lines of of more like robotics, right? So like someone could make a killer robot, you know, and like go kill people with their robot, uh, but it's never happened. Like nobody's ever like attacked a mall with a robot, but there are killer robots. Like there are drones and all sorts of stuff out there in the world. They're just all made by governments, <laughs> you know, like militaries and things make robots to kill people. Um, and so you have like unmanned aerial vehicles and things and I think, you know, there's this idea that there's going to be some lone gunman out there who's going to, like, do this the hard way. You know, like, if you just want to hurt people, gasoline in a match is really easy. If you want to just destroy things, it's super easy to just burn things down or pour chemicals and stuff. But if you want to fix a genetic disease, like, gasoline won't help you. Like, this is the only tool you can really use. So telling people they can't use this tool because maybe someone will misuse it uh, is kind of nonsense because if you just want to hurt people, this is the hardest conceivable way to hurt people, right? It's like, let's spend years doing super advanced research to try and invent a new way to hurt people when I could just like get a rifle and just shoot people. Mm -hmm. Like it's, <laughs> if your goal is to hurt people, this is the hard way. Um, but if your goal is to cure genetic diseases, this is the only tool you've got. Um, and so it's the kind of thing where if you could distribute the technology to all the parents out there who have sick kids, all the dog breeders out there who have sick dogs, all the people out there who themselves are sick and want to fix themselves before something happens that they can't come back from, um, and you let people grow the technology, the same way computers and things like that have grown, uh, biotech will grow. And if you let people do things that are purely aesthetic, like there are people who breed roses for decades 
carefully selecting for specific traits and hybridizing them. And, and these people uh, make beautiful things using genetics, just using it the slow way. So if you gave them the tools to make, make their roses different colors or different uh, expression patterns of like where the colors are or things like that, like it's not a serious risk that like these roses will take over the world. That's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. But what will happen is people will create beautiful things using the tools that they have. And when people do that, not only do they create something beautiful and share it with others, but they create methods and techniques and a body of knowledge. And so imagine you could take the number of geneticists in the world, and instead of it being a few thousand people working for organizations and institutions, and you made it 500,000 people, a million people, like as many people out there as can program computers. If you could make it that accessible, then the kinds of things people would create and the methods and the body of knowledge that would be created would drive the technology to the place where effortlessly curing disease would be a simple task. The complex things would be, let's create new forms of life. You know, let's, let's make, you know, pets from mythology. Like, let's make a unicorn. Let's make a pet dragon. Like, those would be the kinds of things that we'd be looking at. And it sounds crazy, but the computers from the 1960s, which was what, 50 years ago, something like that, were like big punch card machines that flash light bulbs at you, you know, and now they're in everything. Uh, and the technology has mostly not been driven by big institutions uh, and, and governments and big companies. Uh, it's mostly been driven by things like the video game industry and people who are creating products just for people to feel joy with. And so putting it in the hands of anybody so they can create things that are beautiful and interesting and, and sort of life affirming gives you the possibility of creating a, a skill set that makes simple problems just effortless. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of world I want to live in where we've, we've kind of mastered biology and it's, it's as available a tool as computers and you know any damage somebody could do somebody can undo because lots of people know how to use it and the bigger question to me isn't necessarily about what we'll create around us but what we'll create within ourselves because this is i think sort of the end of humanity as we are you know, we've reached a turning point in our evolution. So up until now, evolution has been the primary driving force in genetic change in humanity since, you know, the genesis of life on earth, right? And so all of this evolution from like single celled organisms on through like fish and tetrapods up into, you know, primates and humans has all been driven by survival of the fittest, sexual selection, all the sort of typical things that go along with evolution. But now there's a new force in the driver's seat, right? So now we have the opportunity to choose who we are. And that's never been offered to any species on this planet. And that's a really powerful thing. Um, and I think the really big ethical question for me isn't I'm afraid what somebody will create. It's if humanity is going to become the manifestation of our choices, and I don't think it's avoidable. Like we already have genetically enhanced humans, right? Like there's two or three CRISPR babies right now that we're not fixing a disease that was like, I want to add this trait for this particular reason. And they just did it. So that was like 2019, something like that. And now uh, it's only going to get easier and more available. Um, and so this is the point where humanity sort of takes control of its genetic destiny. We decide who we become. And I don't think we're going to become one thing. I think we're going to become a lot of things. And that's great. You know, I think it would be wonderful to have an explosion of human diversity, right? Like 70% of the world's pot of the world's uh, surfaces, ocean. 
and humans aren't adapted to live in it, but could be. And there's so much possibility, like in the next 300 years, who will we become? Mm -hmm. I don't think we'll be who we are. And I don't think we'll be very recognizable either. Do you think we'll uh, be and alive? As in, do you think um, through genetic engineering, we could actually live for three, 400 years? Do you think that's within uh, our I, lifetime? I think it's possible to create a human who can live that long. I don't think it's possible. I don't think, I think the first people to live those kinds of lifespans will have to have been modified from birth. So I don't think you and me will probably live that long, but I do think people born in 10, 20 years might. Um, if, if they're allowed to be edited in that way, uh, because, you know, we've done a lot with other species. Uh, we just haven't done the, the, the stuff, but the big question though, uh, is if we're going to change who we are by choice, the big question is who does the choosing? Like who can possibly claim the right to decide into what we evolve? And I don't think any government or corporation or individual can decide the evolution of humanity for themselves. I don't think that's a power any, you know, co company or government or anything can claim. So I think the only answer uh, is all of us, you know, it, it has to be all of us that decide. Uh, and I don't think it's gonna, it, it can even be in an organized way. I think we all have to just strive in directions and you know that will create you know new people and i think those people um will look back at us and and uh, i'm curious what they'll think of our choices uh when they think back on the sort of last generation of humanity built by evolution so one of the um one of the uh, researchers in that um a natural selection documentary is um he was interested in wanting to genetically modify um mice that were coming into New Zealand because he was like um this is a huge problem that many of New Zealand's right. facing um how can we solve this problem and when he um went to the local community the the elders within that they were strongly um against it and I think he was talking about the fact that you can pass on a gene that then their offspring would obviously be heavily um, equipped to like they just wouldn't reproduce and that would have a big ripple effect what 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 does that look like then in everybody having CRISPR if you can pass on these um, genetic traits to your offspring so uh, what you're talking about is called a gene drive yeah so what you can do is you can package up like you could just take sort of the CRISPR machinery and uh, put it in a cell and have it do the edit that you want and it could be something completely unrelated you know you're just like really good basketball or something. Um, but you can also then take that CRISPR machinery and include it in the edit that you make so that that cell, you know, that grows into a person now, not only when they reproduce normally passes on the modification, but passes on the modification tools. So what happens is, say you have a mouse uh, and you have like a mutant mouse that you made and a regular mouse and you breed them and they're going to have a litter of mice. Some of them will be modified, some of them won't and you'll keep passing. And so evolution becomes the driving force to constrain uh, like what the allele distribution pattern is in the wild. Like uh, how far your mutated gene spreads depends on how useful it is to the species. So if you're trying to do something like eradicate a species, of mice, um, it doesn't work good because the ones that uh, uh, have the low fertility modification breed less often and that gene gets bred out. Yep. Uh, so if you include the modification sort of machinery in the DNA, then you breed your modified mouse to your unmodified mouse. And instead of just modifying like half of the offspring, it gets the entire thing because it modifies the genes from the mother as well. And then all of their offspring get it and all of their offspring get it. Um, and so if you can do something like uh, dump a whole bunch of male mice out here that have a gene that makes them their daughters infertile, right? They'll breed, they'll have lots and lots of offspring and the males will continue to spread it and all the females will be infertile. So eventually the fertility of the whole population just collapses, right? Mm -hmm. 
So uh, that's being tried in mosquitoes uh, that spread uh, diseases like malaria and Zika and, and things like that. Uh, and it's also being uh, talked about in mice uh, that are you know, invasive and destroying places. The scary part is if one of those mice jumps on a ship and then like cruises back to Europe or something and then gets off and then you know, breeds with the European mouse population, it could cause them to collapse. Um, so biocontainment is a big issue with gene drives. The nice part is uh, if you have an environment like New Zealand, uh, if you can be really, really good with keeping them in, uh, they'll, they could eventually wipe themselves out, and you'd have to, but you'd have to dump a lot of them. And with the gene drives that they've tried, at least in insects, uh, it doesn't work as good as you hope. Like it works that great in the lab because you're talking about a few thousand. But uh, once you get into big field trials that they've done, it sort of spreads for a while and then just dies out because the, the whole population doesn't interbreed as freely as they were thinking. Uh, so there's like, it just sort of occurs in pockets. And so you get local suppression and then they come back next season. So what you'd have, it would be more like a, a wildlife management program where you just have to keep dumping genetically modified ones in the area to kind of keep them at a minimum level. So they're not, you know, killing the local bird population or whatever damage they're doing. Um, the upside is with gene drives for, for things like that is you can do it without, you know, having to go around killing a bunch of animals. You can, you can just put extra animals out there and those animals just don't reproduce well rather than you know, actually going through with traps and poison and things like that, or diseases even, um, to try and kill them. Um, the worry, you know, is that if they go from their non-native environment back to their native environment, it could create problems. But I don't think it would be nearly as big a deal as people were initially afraid it would be now that some field trials have been done. Because <clears throat> it would probably just do a little bit of local damage to the population recover especially with things like mice and mosquitoes their populations have no problem recovering <laughs> um but uh it's obviously dangerous with other species like if you were trying to if, you know you could use gene drives to do a lot of positive things right like um if you have a a, a, a species that's being destroyed by um some disease you know you could genetically uh give them resistance. We could take some naturally occurring resistance, put it behind a gene drive and help that resistance spread more quickly through the population. It would require less death for the whole population to become resistant. Um, the real, so I think in the real world, it's not as scary as it sounds in the lab uh, because it's not quite as effective as they were hoping it would be. Yeah. Um, but also uh, in terms of using it on humans, it's really not scary at all on humans because it doesn't spread like horizontally, you know? So it doesn't spread from person to person like a virus. It sounds like it does uh, when you start talking about it, making its way through the population, but it's not like a virus. So like in order to inherit, in order for your children to inherit those genes, you would have to have, you know, somebody with that gene drive in their genome, be your partner in creating those people. So if you don't want your kids to have those genes, you just don't, have kids with somebody who has those modifications. So if you don't want your lineage to be affected by this gene drive, don't marry someone who has a gene drive. Yeah. So it's pretty easy to avoid. Just like if you didn't want your kids to have blue eyes, don't marry somebody who has blue eyed genes and you won't have blue eyed children. Yeah. So, uh, so for humans, it's pretty easy to avoid because we can make conscious choices. Um, but if you're in some dystopian, if you're in like some dystopian reality where like, um, once again, some individual with a motive decides I want to wipe out a specific race. So I'm going to um, edit the, those specific females, like one female, whatever, that when she reproduces similar, she or her offspring won't be fertile. You saying that that's actually very difficult to do because you yeah. it would just so, rise back up again, like, like the rats. Yeah, I mean, with humans, it would be even easier because like you would know that you have some genetic problem, right? So you would get you would you have, you have fertility issues and so you go to the doctor and the doctor says oh look there's this strange genetic thing uh you know and so you look back at your family history and be like oh it looks like your dad had it too mm -hmm. um and that's where you inherited it from and then they do an investigation they test a bunch of people and then they'd realize that someone generations ago modified someone in your family uh and they would have had to do it as an embryo <laughs> and so 
some doctor in a fertility clinic somewhere modified some embryo, and then that person passed those genes on to you. And eventually we'd recognize, okay, there's this gene drive and eight people have it or something. And so if those people either don't reproduce or uh, you just edit their children so that they don't have that, right? So you can just delete the gene drive with the same editing technologies that created it. So if you wanted to have kids uh, that were your own children without the gene drive, you could just edit it out. Okay. And okay. then it would just go. Yeah, okay. No, that, 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 sounds, that sounds pretty pretty good. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, fair enough. And what, what are your thoughts on bioterrorism in the sense of like, um, you know, obviously COVID was a huge shock for, for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, I remember in the beginning, everyone was like, no, it's just formed from a, an, an, an animal in a, in a cage. And then it was like, actually, this was done in a lab that had been edited. And that's kind of a bit unusual and kind of weird. Um, what yeah. are your thoughts on that in our current environment? And, and do you think it's going to get worse or? So I think bioterrorism will be hard. Uh, I think for something with the resources of a government or a large terrorist organization, uh, I don't even know what any of the large terrorist organizations are anymore. Like is Al Qaeda still a thing? I don't know if they still exist, but something like that scale, you know, they could do like a big operation, have money and people and, and, and like places where they can build things. Uh, I think they definitely could. And I think there will come a time probably where someone does like a bioterrorism attack. Um, but I think it's going to be a lot easier for someone just to take something that already exists, like uh, uh, like smallpox or something. Like that's the scarier part is uh, you could download the genome of smallpox and then reconstruct it. And then you have your very own little vial of smallpox. Um, trying to design something new will be super hard. Um, you know, like they were able to make coronavirus jump to humans uh, by designing it to infect human cells. But that took years of work, right, uh, in, in vaccine research. And, and those sorts of gain of function research is, is like you spend millions of dollars on this stuff, right? Super hard to do uh, as an individual. But if you're talking about, um, you know, uh, piecing together something that already exists, like smallpox, you could. The trouble is, of course, we already have a vaccine for smallpox and they would just start distributing the vaccine again. And everybody over a certain age is already vaccinated. So it wouldn't go as far as people are hoping. But um, those same technologies that allow for things like that to happen are also the same technologies that allow you to fix things. Right. So you can make um, you can make, uh, for example, um, there's a future where you can create humans that are immune to viruses, right? Like from birth, genetically immune to viruses. Yeah, like the um, uh, He Jiang Kui, who made those babies that were immune to HIV. Yeah, and, and, and similar to that, but there are other ways. Like you could, you could recode the codon and all viruses would be incapable of infecting those humans, right? The downside is those humans wouldn't be able to have babies with regular humans anymore. So it'd kind of be a speciation event, but um, they could be completely immune to all viruses. And, and that, that means all viruses jumping from another species, novel zoonotic virus, nothing would touch them. Um, and we've done similar things in E. coli. So we've managed to make E. coli that was 80% immune to all things. And this, is, this would be a huge advanced project, but it could be done. You know, so like uh, making humans that were pretty much impossible to give an infectious disease to is a possible f future we could build right and so like bioterrorism becomes way less scary when nobody can get viruses anymore um and so it's the kind of thing where you know it's the same tool like you know it's the same tool that that you can use to fix it is the same tool that can create problems and so the the disconnect is how do we make sure that we get to the solution prior to the problem, right? Like that would be the ideal scenario. So you don't wanna hit the problem and then find the solution. Um, what we could do, um, you know, is, is like some of the things that are already in place, for example. Uh, like I've been called by the, um, like there are already pretty strong regulations about this sort of stuff. Now that's at least in the US. 
but I, be, I got called the first time I got called by any sort of like watchdog organization. It was the, uh, what is it? International Gene Synthesis Consortium called me, uh, which is an organization of companies that do gene synthesis. Um, and they called me because I was honest. You know, I, I made some designs to send it out for gene synthesis. So they were going to make my DNA and send it to me. Um, and I put on there, they're like, you know, who are you? Blah, blah, blah. Where do you work? I was like, dog breeder and all this stuff. They were like, let's give this guy a call. This sends up some red flags. And so I talked to them, kind of explained what I was doing. And they were like, okay, this is fine. You know, um, you know, but they did like challenge me because it was, it was unexpected. And if I had been getting like chunks of smallpox, they never would have gone through with it. Right. Um, but I want to create so, a new so, strand of monkey pox. <laughs> Yeah. And like, I've been called by the FBI, you know, they're like, Hey, we'd like to talk about some of your recent purchases wow. and things like that. So it's, it's, you know, and it's fine. Like, I know they watch me because of, you know, wow. <laughs> they know I'm tinkering with stuff. So I don't think it's unreasonable, <laughs> but, um, you know, and I don't think, and I think it was just, you know, I was buying some bacteria that are capable of living in a human mouth. So they're like, let's talk about this. Um, but um you know so it's not really that easy to just go right. build dangerous stuff right because the companies that you're going to buy your tools from and your stuff from like it's not a fully self-contained thing you're, you have to like interact with um suppliers of stuff you know chemicals and reagents and all this stuff and if you do suspicious things they'll call the fbi <laughs> you know because they don't want bioterrorism either, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so um, what are your thoughts? Generally, oh, sorry. No, I was, I was just going to say generally, I don't think it's it's um, as much the Wild West as people think it is. Yeah, yeah. No, well, that, that, that's pretty good. What, what are your thoughts then on um, He Juanku? Because, I mean, he, he obviously got far enough to actually produce the twins, uh, the two baby yeah. girls that were me. So people would have known every step of the way then because like you're saying, he would, I mean, I understand he was in a fully fledged lab. Um, yeah, yeah. But that couldn't have gone unnoticed. I mean, that, that yeah. went for way. <laughs> yeah, I'm convinced it definitely didn't. Because first of all, there was there was a third one also that was mentioned in the in the uh, original report. But that one hadn't been born yet. So it's twins and then one more in a, in a different couple. Um, but yeah, there's no way that that went unnoticed. In fact, there were a bunch of American... Um, uh, you know, PhDs and people in various universities in the U.S. that were like having to like, well, yeah, I answered some emails and stuff, but <laughs> so there was a lot of people that knew. Um, and honestly, it's interesting. So that particular story, uh, a friend of mine uh, and uh, a reporter were in a documentary uh, in China looking for somebody working on human genetic engineering right uh and this particular documentary hasn't come out still somehow but they were um uh they were out filming because and honestly there's a clip from i think it's like reason tv or something like that where they interviewed me like a year before that and they were like when will, you know will we see genetically engineered humans in 20 years and it's like i think it's going to be like a year and they'll be coming out of china because you could look at all the papers coming up to that right so they're like CRISPR in a human egg, CRISPR in a fertilized human egg, CRISPR in a human embryo that's two weeks old, CRISPR in a human embryo that's 14 days old. And so it's like, you know, all the steps are there. Like all the preliminary work is done. The next step is just implantation, right? So it's obviously the next step. Uh, but what happened was the reporter guy uh, who worked for MIT Tech, um, he agreed not to... Um, uh, sort of spill the beans, right? Uh, and so they took him into they took him into the the place, and, and they they talked to everybody, and they um, sort of told them what they were doing. You know, like a documentary crew; they're not hiding it. <laughs> and so the uh, and this is like an American documentary crew. And then they came back to um, uh, the U.S. And as soon as they got back, he wrote a story about it, and and and. Uh, uh, 
blew it open. And then all the world press got involved because, you know, it's a big deal. Yeah. And then he had to, he didn't even get a chance to publish papers. He just had to go out at the, what was it? Genetics conference, I forget which one it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and just tell everybody, you know, yeah, this is what we did. You probably saw it in the news last week. Um, we weren't really expecting to reveal results yet. We wanted to do some more testing. Um, but yeah, they weren't hiding it. They were telling people, people knew, you know, uh, people in the U S knew people like they were talking to the media. So yeah, but everybody acts like, well, we didn't know, but that's more like a, it's not my fault sort of thing, you know? Yeah. And the, the other one was, um, Aaron Trawix. He was an interesting guy. And the fact that he, um, died, I, that was very interesting because yeah. wasn't he going against the pharmaceutical companies and then he like yeah i don't think it was related he wasn't a big enough threat to the pharmaceutical companies and <laughs> so like aaron was an interesting character um he didn't really so aaron was a business guy right he was a money guy um he hired me and a handful of other biohackers to build stuff and to also like come up with ideas so one of the ideas was uh a friend of mine uh, another biohacker from outside the US. Um, he wanted to build this, um, he wanted to build this uh, uh, herpes uh, vaccine that he had designed. Problem is he's in Austria. And so in Austria, uh, the regulations are a lot tighter. So you can't really do any of the work. So I was doing some of the work, but of course I'm in a shed in Mississippi. I don't have any funding. Um, I eventually got like some Patreon patrons and stuff like that. But for, but to begin with, I mean, I had to like swap out work for money. So I would have to like do genetics work for other people. And then they would like pay me a little bit and then I could buy reagents and then do genetics work for my, my own projects. And so it's like that sort of thing. And, uh, Aaron comes up and he's like, Hey, I'll, I'll pay for it all, you know? Uh, I've got a company. We'll, we'll, we'll make this happen. So I was like, great, let's do it. So he, he did that. And there was another guy, uh, uh, Tristan, who's also in the documentary. Um, you know, he has HIV, uh, and he wanted to try a different approach and that's where N6 came from. And so we loaded up my, like that same gene therapy platform that I was testing on the mice, um, uh, with N6, uh, which is a, a broadly neutralizing antibody for um, HIV. And so the idea is to just take the antibodies sequence, put it in your cells and have it express in your body and, and hopefully neutralize HIV. Um, testing never really finished. So we don't really know, like the initial tests weren't successful, but I think that's definitely like a dose issue and a bunch of other things. The problem is, you know, Aaron wasn't a very ethical guy. Um, and that's why I quit working with him uh, before he died, like a couple of weeks. So, uh, but, you know, he was the kind of guy who would push for results before he, uh, before he had them, you know? So he was kind of a tech bro, you know, he, um, he wanted, uh, like he wanted to have this, um, he wanted to have this uh, media event at this conference where he was going to show testing this HSV thing. Uh, this wasn't HIV, this was uh, uh, herpes simplex. And uh, it wasn't ready. And the guy who was gonna be tested on uh, wasn't ready to do it because it, it hadn't passed the sort of safety standards that he was comfortable with. So Aaron did it. And from what the guy who actually like mixed it up told me, like he was, uh, uh, he faked it or something. So oh. the whole thing was like staged. But as far as the scene that you see in the documentary on the couch, uh, like I mixed that and I know what was in that and I tested it on myself first. But, yeah. you know, um, it was, uh, it was not intended to be a spectacle about his company, you know, it was intended to be a test that Tristan was doing for himself, you know, and, and Aaron kind of ran off in like a strange direction. And we, I couldn't justify the ethics. So I quit working with him. Maybe two weeks later, I hear that he drowned in uh, essentially a deprivation tank. Mm. Um, 
and later and the toxicology report came back that he he actually had ketamine in his system so i guess he got high got a deprivation tank and flipped over but um yeah i mean just don't get in water if you're high that's a terrible <laughs> idea <laughs> um, probably think you can have some mad like beautiful experience underneath there and then next minute i'm sure and and I, in fact there's some sort of uh from what I heard, was there some sort of meditation technique where you're supposed to do that, like getting a sensor deprivation tank? But that sounds super dangerous to me. Yeah. <laughs> That's like like going swimming in the pool when you're really drunk. That just yeah. sounds super dangerous. Yeah, well, on LSD. Uh, <laughs> sounds like yeah, you have exactly. to swim. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, if you're in water, you want to be like at your clearest. Yeah. But um, no, I don't think Aaron was a, I don't think there were some theories that circulated around that he was like, you know, killed by the pharmaceutical companies or something like that. But to me, like if they wanted to kill, like Aaron didn't know any of the science, you know, if they wanted to kill, it would have been the biohackers he hired, you know, like I still have all the stuff. It's in my freezer over there. All the stuff that was worked Are on. You be saying and, that? <laughs> yeah. If they haven't killed me yet, they're not about to. But no, I mean like N6, all the HSV stuff, all, it's all of it's in my freezer, you know, it was all built here. So I'm not worried that uh, it was something like that. Because if they were going to come after somebody, it would have been me and the other biohackers, not um, Aaron, because Aaron was yeah. the money. But Yeah, yeah okay. No, know, that's, it's, that's fair enough. And with yeah. your, what sort of engineering, out of curiosity, have you done on yourself? Like, what sort of... Uh, so, with the... T so, <laughs> so, testing on the mice completed successfully. Uh, so, the next step is to test on a much larger animal, right? Yeah but I'm not about to go testing stuff on my dogs. So I'm testing it on myself. So, um, <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, it worked on the mice. I'm pretty fine. But so there's a, um, there's a gene therapy that was developed in, um, or at least it was tested, uh, at the university of Ohio in 2008 for muscular dystrophy. Uh, it wasn't very successful with muscular dystrophy, even though like, it increased ambulation time and stuff like that. So basically it made the people that was tested on stronger, but uh, it doesn't really fix the core problem of muscular dystrophy because it's not just about atrophy and muscle wasting, right? So there's fibrosis and all sorts of damage because the muscles themselves can't take strain because dystrophin is sort of like a, a bunch of tough spring proteins that sort of like, give your muscles some resistance to tearing and damage and stuff like that and make them uh, resilient. So if you don't have dystrophin, your muscles are very fragile. So making them stronger helps your mobility, but it doesn't solve the core problem. Um, but uh, so folostatin is a hormone uh, that's been tested a lot in various things, but uh, essentially it's a myostatin inhibitor. So that's the the modifications i've done on myself is testing that uh with myostat inhibitor the problem i'm getting is i can get short-term expression but not long-term expression so that's okay. what i'm trying to solve is so your body kills those your body kills those um cells that you've edited is uh that... it's more like it's or it's probably to some degree but not likely uh, uh, in a large way because folostatin is a natural human gene Right. Uh, so there's nothing really for your immune system to latch on to. Right. So like your immune system doesn't recognize something is different. It can change expression patterns and sometimes that sometimes that can cause the apoptosis and things like that. Um, but no, the main thing is probably gene silencing. So okay. the individual cell recognizes that this gene uh, is being you know, highly expressed. And it's not coming from the genomes because I've got uh, uh, sort of episodes, things that I've been working with. And so uh, it will just turn that off. It'll be like, mm, this seems suspicious, turning that off. And so it'll turn it off. So you get expression for a short period of time and then it turns off, similar to how the, the RNA vaccines work. Yeah, okay. And even when COVID first came out, uh, me and a group of biohackers, uh, we made our own vaccine before the vaccines were available. So we uh there was a study that came out in i think it was may some sometime uh early-ish like springtime uh where they tested uh just expressing spike spike protein in uh, uh, uh macaques so they did this in, in monkeys 
and then they did a challenge trial so they actually gave the monkeys COVID after that um and and so the ones that got the vaccine didn't get sick and the ones that did did get sick um and so they you know tested they did all the animal testing you would want to do next thing you would do is human testing right so we're like this really isn't complicated it's spike protein on a plasmid right uh so we just built it the problem was the doses were huge right um so it was like uh 10 mls of of liquid you know so instead of like one cc or like one uh one uh milliliter uh injection it was like 10 <laughs> per so it was like you know so i did like five in one arm five in the other arm then two weeks later another five and another five and those volumes hurt <laughs> so wow. But yeah, it was like a temporary gene therapy. You express spike protein, your immune system gets pissed off at it. Um, and I didn't get COVID until Omicron came through and started dodging all the vaccines. But well, what yeah. is, I'm, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask what your thoughts are with the um, COVID vaccine. It's not the one that you created, but the one that was passed out to everyone. It's quite a controversial yeah. topic, particularly in America. Yeah, I think, you know, um, like I think it's it's good to have vaccines like I, I'm not scared of it um I think there's definitely like with any vaccine uh there's a risk profile right like no vaccine is 100% safe for sure um and really no medication is Tylenol has some probability of killing you right um so ultimately you have to uh you have to judge like is it better like is the cure more dangerous than the disease and so the risks are you know, uh, if you rush a vaccine quickly, you don't necessarily understand all the risks, and especially if you don't test it in all the different kinds of people, right? So like, if you don't test it in like five-year-old boys, you don't know how it's gonna affect five-year-old boys. And so you don't know if the risks are worth them. And so, and so some of the new research that's coming out is saying things like uh, COVID is lower risk uh, in young boys than the vaccine is, right? Mm. Um, and so there's definitely, I think as, Sort of the data matures we'll see that uh there were definitely people who totally should get the vaccines and some of the vaccines are going to be much better than others and safer than others um and they're going to find that like um you know some people really benefited and some people probably didn't benefit in any meaningful way um and some people probably more at risk from the vaccine than the disease uh, but it's difficult and it takes time to sort out who's who and that's why I think personally it, it should be a personal choice. Like it's like yeah. any other medical thing, you know, you have to, um, you can't just say, you know, this is your body. I'm going to modify it in some way that I decided that's, mm. that's like the foundational human right. But uh, I read um, recently the BBC report um, that gosh, a research hospital in the UK based edited the genome of a 12 year old girl, Alyssa suffering from leukemia she had failed dozens of therapies and had no more options several months later she's cancer free so awesome. i thought that was like a really cool um you know way to for people who are quite nervous of this um and i understand there are some concerns that many people have and i hope that um this podcast is like touched on them and um yeah if you were uh, had one message i love to ask this because it's uh, a podcast um if you had one message to share with the world what what would that be mm -hmm. I think, I think it would be that all of this stuff is very new. Um, and I understand that it's scary, but I think all life takes courage. And I think if we can find our courage as a species, we have the opportunity with these tools to open up all the doors to everything we ever wanted humanity to become. Uh, and if we don't find our courage, I think we run the risk of empowering a very small group of people um, and giving them all the keys to our future. And I think, I think we really have to think better of that. Beautiful, very wise. No, well, uh, thank you so much, David, for joining me today. I really um, appreciated this conversation and I learned so much. So um, thank you for your time. Yeah, no problem. I had a lot of fun.